my name is Jamie Lee. I work here on, and I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of SFU's Fan City Office of Community Engagement. Um, we are really excited about tonight. We partner with Heritage Vancouver and with Phil uh, a few times a year, so many of you probably know this if you come more than once. Um, this is uh, actually just before we start, I just want to recognize and acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave people. Um, and tonight's event is brought to you on behalf of our Office of Community Engagement and Heritage Vancouver. Um, I think this is the third, third, third conversation in Contested Places, which is the theme for this season. And I think we'll just jump into it because we lost a lot of time, so I will bring Javier on the stage. much time. I want to thank you all for coming and thank you for coming back after all that, which is great to see that we have interest in this. Um, I'm very excited about this talk because really it's where we're getting into the ground floor and it's something that we're starting to do more and more and try to get people engaged and reach out to communities that these things are starting to happen rather than to you know show up as the building is burning. So I think this is very exciting that way to get up on the ground floor more or less. I think this also touches on so many themes in Vancouver around density and the way we use density and transit oriented development and things about how the residential neighborhoods can contribute to the density that will need to go into the city and uh, ultimately what heritage means in that state um, and how we shape the city and how heritage can contribute to all that. So I'm glad to see all here and joining that conversation and uh, sort of help us to define ultimately what heritage means to the city of Vancouver. So thank you once again, I'll let uh, Bill Yoon talk and introduce the panelists. Hi. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, so just a few things. Uh, I want to let you know that the talk is being audio recorded, and so with our with our talks, we, um, we have the audio recording for the panelists and also for the Q&A. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, please be aware that you might be recorded, and if you're not, if you're not comfortable with that, you can uh, maybe direct your question to one of our assistants. Harun is in the back, and he may, um, he can ask for you. Um, so with that, I just want to start with um, a brief sort of framing discussion, and I want to talk about heritage first. Um, our previous talk was on Falls Creek South, and when we had that talk, there were some comments about what's the heritage of Falls Creek South, and so similar to that, we had some comments about Mount Pleasant where someone kind of came to us and said, well, there's no real, there's nothing really to talk about. There's just a few old buildings. And so um, this sort of persistent view that heritage is only about architectural conservation and historic commemoration um, is pretty strong. And I, if you think that, then I would like you to, well, I would like to invite you to consider a broader um, con conception of heritage. And so that when we speak about cities, we need to talk about heritage. And this is particularly important now because with the planning for this area and city council approved the citywide plan uh, yesterday. And if you're not convinced why we should, why heritage should have a big role, this is why. So heritage seeks to understand what is of value to people. And so that's a range of values, not just um, about keeping old buildings or putting up plaques. And, and we wanna, know those values so that we can decide in what manner that heritage is taken forward. And so that's linking spatial issues with social issues and human experiences. So the city is not a blank canvas, and there are underlying cultures, uh, routines, associations, meanings, ideas, objects, uses, capabilities, with which form the identity of an area. So when we make interventions into our environment, um, there's going to be positive effects and negative effects, but we need to be aware of this ecology and how people have a relationship to the environment around them. And so we have to plan for change based on that. Um, now, in the sort of uh, um, terms of reference for the Broadway Quarter Plan, there's been some sort of references to statements of uh, heritage statements of significance um, to the heritage. And so I think. Also with the citywide plan process coming up, I want to say that what we really need to do is not just focus 
on the constituent parts of an area, but also the, the, what the relationships people have with those parts. Here's an example. This is, uh, so Mount Pleasant, this is Jean. Um, so you see the, the building, but it's actually a very important gathering space. Um, there's, I believe, affordable artist studios upstairs. Uh, the street is not just uh, a line that connects people from point A to point B. There's a very important use of the street where people sit outside on both sides. This is another section of Mount Pleasant where you have, the, under the green awning, awning there's a uh, hair salon. But inside the hair salon, I think there's a, a cell phone shop. So this might look very ordinary to you, but that use, that sort of low entry uh, retail opportunity um, is quite important for uh, small businesses. This is a uh, view court housing. So, you know, people think of the heritage as the brick uh, building here and the windows. But this is co-op housing. And the idea of co-op housing uh, has gotten a lot of traction recently with uh, our housing crisis. Um, also, um, it speaks to a time when the federal government was more involved in, in creating these types of co-ops. This is Quebec Manor. This is also uh, co-op housing. But in this picture, there's a person there. And that's Danielle uh, Peacock. She's, um, she's a resident in the building. And um, I think it's important to, to see how this place shaped this person. Danielle is pretty active in the community. She volunteers her time a lot. And so um, we're talking about her maybe being shaped by this area, living in the building, being a pro productive member of society. So um, human capital. So tonight we're, we're talking about Mount Pleasant um, in relation to the Broadway plan. Um, now the Broadway plan was approved sort of terms of reference were approved uh, by city council uh, earlier in the year. Uh, we sent out a link, I believe, uh, through Eventbrite to that document. And so we got some, uh, we spoke to um, a member of the Mount Pleasant Plan, and he's here with us tonight in the audience. John Rottenberg's there. And so he sent me these speaking points, which I'll, uh, I'll just quickly read through. Um, so the intent is to, um, coordinate a comprehensive planning for the Broadway area with the delivery of a Broadway sub subway rapid transit project. There will be a comprehensive area plan. It's like a community plan. And so there will be policies for land use, job space, affordable housing, park and public space, arts and culture, local business, heritage, and community amenities. It will consider the role of Broadway uh, in the larger context of the city, but also allow for local neighborhood planning. Uh, the council adopted the terms of reference for the Broadway planning program in June 2018. And the public process is going to begin um, in January 2019. Uh, the outreach and the engagement process will be inclusive to include and involve a broad range of interested parties. And specific attention will be given to small businesses. This is the study area. Uh, sorry I got cut off on the um, your right side, but um, the, the blue part on, on the uh, right side <coughs> with the T, that's the proposed transit station for Maine and Bravo, which is the area we're gonna be kind of focused on tonight. Um, <coughs> and so we've also, in that link that you got, there's, that's also the link to the page for the city of Vancouver Broadway plan. So you can sign up for correspondence and also find uh, documents on that page. There are a couple of things um, about the plan uh, around rezonings. And uh, so this is from that terms of reference. Generally, rezonings will not be considered in the Broadway plan study area while the Broadway plan process is underway. So I believe that the process is going to be about two years. 
So during that time, there's no real rezonings being considered. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions. Uh, I think um, for 100% social housing, exceptional circumstances, and, and then um, for active applications. If you look at the right side and the, um, the red part, uh, where it says Main Street, um, there's some shading there, and this is from a, a map on the Terms of Reference document, where it talks about what, which parts are being considered for change. So that salmon-colored part um, is be, being considered for some um, limited market strata. And the pink part below, where it says Mount Pleasant IC3, is being considered to maximize below market rental units. And the last thing I want to talk about is the, this new policy measure to curb speculation. Um, there's something called a DCE, Development Contribution Expectation, and that's to limit land value speculation. And if you read that highlighted part, so a development contribution expectation is intended to limit land value speculation by ensuring that owners, realtors, and developers are made aware of the city's intention to preserve and grow affordable rental housing, job space, and public benefits along the corridor. So finally, I'm just going to talk about our objectives tonight. Uh, Alyssa, one of our panelists, asked me a big question, what are our objectives for tonight? And so, I would say that um, we here at Vancouver believe in the importance of the public sphere. And so, we want everyone here to be exposed to perspectives to help you make judgments when planning your city. And so we try to bring together uh, a diversity of views. And um, so views around density, land development, economics, that may be underappreciated, but also um, talk about heritage and, and our societal changes. So if you're going to be participating in the upcoming planning process, we hope that this will help inform you and, and give you something to think about. With that, I want to turn to our panelists. And so um, we have Alyssa Myshop. Uh, she's a Mount Pleasant resident, participant in Mount Pleasant Community Plan, and a lifelong transit user. I'm not going to read the bios. It's um, there's a link there, and, and there's a brochure. You can read the full bio. Uh, Tamim Rad is to the far your left. Um, he's principal of Access Planning Consultants, former director of Street Planning and Policy at Translink. Sarah Savoy is next to her. Uh, sorry, next to him. Uh, she's the owner of Much and Little. And then we have Councillor Wee. He's the owner of Eight and a Half Restaurant, past president of Mount Pleasant BIA, and now city councillor. Uh, I also want to inform you that we tried to get uh, Port Living, the development company, a representative for them to come out. Uh, there was an article a few months ago in, in the Globe and Mail by Carrie Gold where it talks about um, some of the concerns that. Uh, Mount Pleasant's facing, and um, uh, Port Living was mentioned as a developer who had bought a significant amount of property in the area around Maine and Broadway. And so we corresponded with them for two, three weeks to try to get them to come tonight, but ultimately we're not, we were not successful and, and they couldn't make it. Um, as I said, City of Vancouver staff, um, John Grottenberg from the Broadway planning team is here. Scott Hine is here. Um, former senior urban designer with the city of Vancouver, and he was quite active uh, with the Mount Pleasant implementation plan and community planning at, at the time. Uh, Eric Adnan, are you still here? Did we lose you? Well, okay, perhaps. He, he, uh, he was a planning instructor and a planning consultant specializing in industrial land uses, and, and he was helping uh, us and, and, and uh, talk about some of the uh, economic effects. Uh, and also, uh, Amy, are you here? Amy Robinson's here um, with Local BC. She's been speaking out a lot about property taxes and uh, something called um, highest and best use, which we might get to later. So with that, I want to turn to our discussion. Thank you. Hi. So um, I just want to start the conversation um, and talk about Mount Pleasant identity. And so maybe I'll start with Sarah. So Sarah, you opened your business about seven years ago? I did. So can you tell, can you tell us you know, what 
led you to the neighborhood? I, I think we talked about this before, but there's something specific about the neighborhood that you feel is special? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I opened um, my shop in October of 2011, and I, in the research and planning phase of the business, I looked at all sorts of different neighborhoods to be in. And intuitively, I was very much drawn to Mount Pleasant. Um, I looked at Commercial Drive, um, you know, Kitsilano, Dunbar, further up Main Street, but it was Mount Pleasant that really, really spoke to me. And I think it's because there's a, there's a vitality there, there's um, an energy there, it's a little bit uh, offbeat, a little bit quirky. Um, there's a creative energy there. Uh, there's an energy of possibility. Um, and it has a soul. So I wanted to be part of that. So that's why I chose Mount Pleasant. Does anyone else? I mean, everyone either has their business there or lives there. Does anybody else want to comment? Sure, I mean, I can add to, I can add to uh, that. I think it's precisely the kind of business that's there that kind of brought, that brought us to, to Mount Pleasant. I, I have to admit, I, I look at cities through the eye of a planner as well as somebody who uses city streets, and I, I say that there's a few reasons. One is um, that um, just Main Street is just like, have an incredible diversity to it. I can't think of, uh, of, of, of a neighborhood or that within the city of Vancouver that has such an intensity of, and diversity of, of retail uh, that's within walking distance of, of you know, really vital communities and, and neighborhoods. And so being part of that residential mix was really attractive to me. And, and one of the reasons my wife and I decided to move to Mount Pleasant actually from uh, Fraser and King Edward was to be part of that uh, mix. And I'd say also um, it's, it's if, to break it down to the word, is confluence. I, I was thinking about this a little bit today, but it's this connection of all of these incredible uh, points of history in Vancouver, and it's it's incredibly central. So it's the point at which the downtown area, which you know the central area, is is something that is you know you might want to have access to. Is that there's a lot of amenity there, um, and then and then having these residential areas on your doorstep really provide that access to it. And then the I think the most important is that 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 collision of east and west is there that provides for that diversity, and you see it in the parks. You see it outside our park, out at Mount Pleasant Park at uh, 16th in Ontario. You see it in the schools. We wanted our kids to have um, uh, be part of that diversity that you don't really find. It, it, it's really that, that kind of melting pot that's really unique in the city, uh, both for businesses uh, and, and, for, or, and for people in the socioeconomic demographic. So that was really what drew us to it. So um, I mentioned the Globe and Mail article um, a little bit when I was doing the framing there. And I don't know if you've read the article, um, but in, in that article, it, it said that uh, uh, a lot of properties were being bought up. A dozen shops are in buildings that are already sold. Some have left, and, and other sort of shop owners are waiting. And over 50% of the properties have been sold. So, uh, Councillor, you were interviewed in that article. And um, so, can you kind of speak to, and maybe Alyssa too, like, right? What are some of the concerns around um, what I guess we see as sort of developers maybe thinking that there's going to be a uh, development opportunity here? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. I think one of the big ones is that what we liked about Mount Pleasant is that it had that complete community feel where you had everything you need in Mount Pleasant. And I think that's something that we're a little bit nervous of right now. A lot of the small business owners are having <coughs> demolition clauses added to their new leases or rates that continue to go up where some of the business owners are basically not making any money anymore, but they love what they do and they love their staff so much that there isn't time right now to reinvest in their business because they might only have two, three, four years left in their lease. So we're seeing this kind of stress with small business owners now where they're nervous that there is no longevity for them in the area. And that's something that scares other business owners around because they want to be in a place that has that energy and that kind of vitality. We talk about where you know all the owners around. I know so many of the businesses. I love when I walk around Mount Pleasant because I know the people where I go get my food from. I know the people where I shop. I walk in every morning and say hi. But as you start seeing them leave, and this has happened over a period of time as well. So I think in 2009, there was a scare in Mount Pleasant when the big fires hit. We had two fires. 
knocked out a lot of businesses at Main and Broadway. I just opened up the restaurant and came in because there's businesses there. And at that time, there's a shock because people are like, I don't know what's going to come in. Are we going to get some worms or are we still going to have the coffee shops that we had, the Lugs, the Milton Penguin, and stores we did lose? So I think there's a time then when people got scared in Mount Pleasant. And then I think about five years ago, it was the same thing. We had another kind of shift where we were losing some of our businesses and people got nervous again. But I think this last wave, this last year, has been a new shift where I think people are really nervous that the businesses like John Jukes that had been there for 30, 35 years that were iconic, places like that weren't even iconic but had, had created history. And even on 2nd to Main, there's a building that used to be called Portland Ave. It was the record shop in the Pacific Northwest. You wouldn't know it from the outside. A lot of people not pleasant knew about it, and you could tell the story when they walked past, or the narrow, and these little places that we have as little secrets in Mount Pleasant. And the more we lose those secrets, I think the more the identity of Mount Pleasant is like Thanks, so said you have a comment? You're not a business owner in the area. I, right? I'm not a business owner. I, I am a business owner, and my business is actually a block away. And it's kind of interesting living in Mount Pleasant. Um, again, we, we picked it affordability at the time was one of the issues, but um, you know, the vitality was another. But I am drawn to places with character. Um, admittedly, Gastown has changed incredibly since I moved here and started working here in 1992. Um, I do work in design and development. So, you know, there's kind of a connection between me and heritage and new development. Um, but just getting back back to something I wanted to add to identity um, and kind of transition into the small businesses and why people moved to Mount Pleasant and I think we have to look historically why my, where Mount Pleasant came from and it was in fact the first suburb um, outside of downtown Vancouver. So when it developed, it developed as a complete community and the cool thing was is that it's actually in sort of four quadrants. So we have, I have to think about this and get my directions right. In the northwest, it's all industrial. And then as you move over to northeast, you've got a lot of high density in Waka. And of course, with the industrial, you had a lot of dock workers and, you know, sort of all the laborers. So there was housing that developed around that. In the southeast, you have sort of more of that worker housing, sort of, um, you know, more common basic houses. But then there was also a creek that ran through, Burry Creek, and which is really unique about Mount Pleasant because Mount Pleasant grew around Burry Creek. And it grew with industry and businesses. And so some of those business owners built their houses nearby. And we see in, in Southwest, you know, some really nice heritage homes um, and larger places. So there is such a diversity of um, economics, always has been. And, um, you know, everything that came with it, uh, immigrants, low-cost workers, everything. And then in the middle, there's this hub. And that hub is right where our transit station is going to be, at, at Main and Broadway. And so that was the business center. And in fact, I think there are five or six buildings in there that were actual bank buildings. And one of the first buildings was, um, I think it was Royal Bank, where Dandelion Records was. And so, there's this incredible um, history that has made Mount Pleasant what it is. And I think that everybody who's come in there, the small business owners, have been drawn to that. The residents have been drawn to that. And so I think when everybody sees this shift, everyone who, new and old, people coming in, people looking at the area, are nervous because they say, well, is this going to last? Do I want to renew my lease? Do I want to fight to be here, and do I want to spend that extra money to live in this area when everything I love is going to disappear because it's going to be bulldozed and the character's lost. So Sarah, I just want to come back to you and, and, and um, follow up on the counselor's comment and, and Alyssa's comment. Um, so you're part of the commercial character of Mount Pleasant. Uh, but you, we talked before. You have a you have a very specific situation of how you're affected. And so, do you feel you're at at, at risk in, in the neighborhood? And um, I know your bio says you, you fought to stay in Mount Pleasant. Right? So, can you tell us you know, briefly your story? And also, 
you know, development is coming. Don't you feel that this is going to help you as a business owner? Because people are going to come and you're going to spend money and, and you have business. Um, well, just to give a little bit of the history, the recent history of what's happened with my business. So a year ago, I found out that my rent was going up 80%. And I know we're, it's hard to talk about this without mentioning affordability, because it's still another facet of this discussion. But um, I couldn't afford an 80% increase. So I started looking right away and just started hustling. <laughs> And I really, really wanted to stay in the neighborhood. Um, I looked other places. I, you know, considered moving out of the neighborhood. But so this is what I mean when I, I really fought to stay in the neighborhood. Um, and I've just recently, as of September, October, I've moved my shop. So I went from 1,500 square feet to 750 <coughs> square feet, and I'm essentially paying the same rent as I was before. <laughs> So it's a big shift, and I'm still getting used to the new space. But, um, you know, I, I've, chosen, <coughs> I've chosen to stay in the neighborhood. So I'm choosing to, to just deal, deal with the price or the rental increases. Um, and I feel like, um, I feel like gentrification is, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's inevitable. Change is inevitable. And um, as you mentioned, you know, so the fire was in 2009. So there was a shift there. And then I feel like when I moved into the neighborhood in 2011, I was also part of the gentrification of new different shops moving in. And at the time in my block, there was Archetype, there was Sunny Spot Cafe. Um, I was moving in and well, Nelly, the little bike shop was moving in with me at the same time. Um, and then there was Bird on a Wire, and Cactus uh, was there already, I think. Um, and then now, <laughs> um, it's just me in my building, and the two units on either side of me are papered up. My old unit is papered up. And, um, um, yeah, so I'm, you know, there's just, there's definitely a sense of dis-ease, unease in the neighborhood. I chat with my neighbors, fellow shop owners, and everybody has a plan B. Every nobody's really. We're just wondering what is going to happen within the next, and we're thinking in chunks of like three years, four years, five years. We're not thinking in ten-year terms, or so everybody is thinking of a a possible exit plan. Um, yeah, and just to add to that, I, I think um, one of the things that's really great about Main Street is it's incredibly local. And that's what gives it its charm, its character. And I don't think anybody really expects it, Main Street, to uh, be static, because that's also part of its character, is it's an evolving street that evolves to uh, the circumstance of the people and the residents that are around. But I think one of the, the great things that really, um, uh, that really anchors Main Street and Mount Pleasant as a special place in, 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 this, in this city is the fact that it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly local street. So, we just found out that our, our my wife and, and we went to elementary school together. Um, somebody who lives across the street from me owns uh, Vancouver Special. Um, another uh, resident that lived uh, in our in our previous neighborhood, also in the general area, owns Lucky Comics. So these are just you know stores that are just outside the, the Mount Pleasant area that are still part of that that street and that character. And so I think that's one of the things that, that's really worth fighting to preserve is that local character and nature of, of, of the street, yeah. even in the face of change. Yeah, so it's also, it's like what you mentioned, expanding the definition of heritage outside of just architectural structures. It's an experience, it's a feeling, it's um, the culture and um, the psychology of when you are in a neighborhood. So gentrification, okay, but it's the gentrification towards finality <laughs> is what I'm worried about. The gentrification towards sameness is what terrifies me. Um, I just want to jump in and and um, I think where, where heritage, the definition of heritage has really shifted is we talk about tangible and intangible heritage. So everything that Sarah said is the intangible heritage. And um, something that we, we talk about the vitality, and it's really, 
important to analyze, like, what is it that really makes Main Street great? Well, it's local businesses, but it's not just local businesses. You know, every, I'm going to say 10 feet, I'm sure it's 15. Um, there's another storefront, and it's small. It's small local businesses. It's walkability. It's not, I need to go to five stores, and I need to go 10 blocks for those five stores. It's, I can go to five stores, and those five stores are within two blocks. And, and they serve local needs, you know. So I think maybe we'll come back to the gentrification later. Maybe someone from the audience might have a question about that, actually. But so we were talking to John uh, earlier in the room, and, and this is just just to be clear. This is very very early days uh, with respect to uh, the Broadway border planning, and so there's been no sort of decisions really made, right, John? So. He's just really here to listen and, and, and to take in what everyone's going to be saying. Um, so in terms of, you know, when we think of there's a station going in, we might think of transit-oriented development, big towers. But that might not happen. We don't know at this point. It's, it's pretty open, and I think what they're looking at is consultations with the community. So, you know, in relationship to sort of keeping some of these characteristics of, of um, the neighborhood, uh, I think there's a lot of fear that uh, development or, or big increases in density are going to affect the, the, the characteristics of the neighborhood. So I just want to ask to anybody, maybe the councillor first, um, if you know, what you see as a good sort of um, balance of, of, of density in here. Uh, thank you. Uh, we met, there's a few of us here that I see in the crowd, on the Mount Pleasant Implementation Committee. So when I joined the neighborhood, I was initially, I think it was less than six months, I was part of the BIA, and we have the Executive Director Neil in the back, of the Mount Pleasant BIA currently. Um, we joined the Implementation Committee, and that was a whole bunch of residents spending a lot of time, two times a week, doing sticky notes, where we'd want to see the plan, where we'd see density, how we had a number that we're supposed to deal with, and it was like 30,000 people were moving to Mount Pleasant. And it was an amazing process where I recognized how the city was involved as a community to build where we thought density could go. We picked three locations. We thought it could go with the parking lot of Safeway, the parking lot at uh, Kingsgate Mall, and the third, with three other spots, and the right side. So we had three spots we thought the towers could go. And the rest of it, we really wanted to make sure Main Street kept that heritage look to it, the heritage height to it, so it kept it in the plan, saying it was that way. We're looking at second to seven. So we did an amazing design. Everyone has a chance to look at it. The Mount Pleasant Community Plan is about a 100-page book that talks about how we make Main Street no longer 100 feet wide at 7th Avenue, right? Because it is too dangerous to cross if you're a senior. I mean, how do we make it more walkable? I mean, it is an original streetcar neighborhood, but there's a lot of elements that the community saw as benefits and cultural components that were put into that book. And then at the end of it, we were shut down and we were told that our terms of reference had ended and that if we wanted to contact council, that we could write a letter to Mayor Council. Um, which is interesting now because that really was a driver for me to really move into politics. And now I would be getting those letters and I'm looking forward to those letters. So I think that that is a big component of it is when we make sure that the community is involved in consultation, that when they get to the end of it, they don't feel heard and don't feel that it was implemented. It is very, very frustrating. And I watched so many people basically say they real relationships, they threw so much time into this, and they got nothing at the end. So I think that's what we need to do. Yesterday, we just approved a community citywide plan, and we're hoping the last citywide plan got over 100,000 people involved. So we're hoping that we get over 100,000 people again and really get the community as a whole to really design how this city can move forward. Can you just repeat your question, though, please? <laughs> I think generally it was about, you know, how do you think the, you know, there's going to be some density and development yeah, happening, yeah. right? So how do you think that should sort of land on the ground? Um, so I was involved in the whole community plan, I think, since it started in 2006, and I got involved in 2007, and actually Mike, Mike and I met there. Um, Sarah said it was a small community. Um, and, and we did. We, we talked about that density, where does it land, and yes, we need to incorporate it. But not what de de just density, but what kind of density. And really what everyone agreed upon was it needed to be 
spread out? Why does everybody have to be loved together? And it came back to character. You know, we love Mount Pleasant the way it is. It's got character, it's got walkability. Let, let's keep it and let's enhance our streets. Let's keep it a walking neighborhood and, and a community unto itself. Um, the funny thing is, is um, Danielle, who's in the back there, um, as Mike said, it drove the, the end of the, the implementation committee and shutting down drove him to um, run or become a counselor and it drove us to start the Mount Pleasant Heritage Group because we really felt that through the process, heritage was acknowledged as such an important factor. But as soon as the developers started coming in, heritage disappeared off the page. So it's, it's sort of interesting. Um, I want to reiterate again, I think the process that the city did with the community plan, all of the planners that were there, it was an amazing process. Um, I do encourage people to get involved um, with the one that comes up. Well, I think also I just realized that's what you asked me and I totally didn't answer the question. <laughs> so I went that off on a tangent. But as a shop owner, if you ask me about density, of course I want density around. Of course density is, is great for business, but it's just the form of the density, how it takes place. It can, it doesn't have to be in one, two, three big chunks. It can be dispersed. It's like, as you said, a walking neighborhood. So, so about that dispersal, no. I just want to direct your attention to, to the map. So on your, your right, you see Main Street and that sort of salmon colored strip. So that's the map from the terms of reference. And um, so that red part shows uh, areas that will be considered um, for, for change. So it's concentrated from 16th to 7th, I believe, on Main Street there. And, and then we also talked about concentrating some density in the Rise Alliance Independent Building and, and then Kingsgate Mall. Now, do, so I just wanted to throw a question. Is there a bigger responsibility by the neighborhoods or by, by the whole city to disperse that even more? Like, why are we concentrating the density on that street like that? Could we, could we, you have this thing called Making Room, which went to council again today for duplex zoning. And we wrote a letter um, about Making Room. We sort of, uh, a few months ago, supported the idea of maybe densifying the single-family zones, but we questioned how it was going to be done and how it was going to be carried out. Now, now that we have a citywide plan, and we look at the city in aggregate, and we look at, okay, we need an X number of um, units for housing for people who need to be here and, and can afford to live here, how do we disperse that in aggregate across the city? Do we have to, is it, is it Good to just concentrate on the street like that, or can we go in other ways? Yeah, uh, can I maybe take a stab at that one? And uh, from my perspective, there's kind of two kinds of uh, pressures that come to bear on, on, on that. One is the development pressure for developers that want to maximize profit. So they want to get as much density as possible. A developer will put as many stories on as the city will let them. And the, the pressures from the city's perspective is there's this conflict of objectives where the city uh, wants to see uh, you know a, a, a densified city so they can you know reduce reliance on the automobile, increase transit use, encourage more walking and cycling, provide more affordable housing, all of those things. But they're but the, what they face often is community resistance in getting it in. And so the, the what what often happens is that the city will will go to those areas where it's easiest. So those are brownfield sites where there's going to be not a lot of, you see that around, around uh, Joy Station. One side of Joy Station is a, uh, developed with high-rise towers, the other isn't. Uh, not that high-rise towers is the solution for the other side of, of Joy Station, but they're just as you know, single-family residential and more can be done with that. And so that's what you see is the concentration on corridors and, um, and on, on those, those, uh, those large sites that bear the brunt of development. And there are other models. So we know if you look to European cities, they have, um, you know, in our downtown core, just to give you some numbers, is the population is about 200 people per hectare. The overall city population density is about 40 people per hectare. A city like Copenhagen with a, with a much more even development gets about 80. That's twice the density of the city of Vancouver without any high rises whatsoever. So it supports that point that density can take a lot of forms. 
And we don't have the history of uh, Copenhagen where that was developed over time of that even density, but there is a lot in between these high-rise towers that punctuate uh, uh, these, these, these specific sites and nodes and a single family residential. And I think that's the trick, is finding out how to smooth out that density throughout the city. And not necessarily seeing it as spreading out the impact, but spreading out the benefit of what can result from a higher density but a more gently developed city. Um, this, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say, I think it would be interesting if we flipped this approach and we kept our main street at human scale. You know, let, let, let's keep the walkability, let's keep the appeal. And what happens if we go into these single family residences and we rethink the zoning. You know, we keep building upon a plan, upon ideas that are as old as the city. And maybe we really need to rethink where we are as a society, where we want to go, and rewrite something completely. <laughs> but that's where the city planning process comes into play because the, the problem, the challenge that we have often is that we, we're dealing with planning at a site by site or, a, or on a community basis and what the city, what's been absent in the city is a, is a comprehensive vision for the city and then driving from that to what should be happening at a neighborhood scale and a corridor scale. So it, it leads to debates and to fights about density. We saw that, you know, Scott had to deal with this at Grandview uh, Woodlands and his history with that on the, on the Safeway site. And you know we need to craft processes that are, are more engaging, not just at the community level, but at the citywide level, so that there's you know there's a common vision for what we're moving towards as a as a city. And then that that doing this kind of planning at the corridor, I'll talk about the property owners and have a lot of this discussion um, with small business. We don't talk for our property owners, and Mount Pleasant has some very fortunate property owners like the Heritage Triangle that don't charge triple net rent that have allowed small business to stay there. We've had other ones that have tried to stay there, but now new property tax have had to sell to Fort Living and others. We don't recognize that there's a relationship between a small property owner and their tenant, and they've been there for 20 years and have a really good relationship, and that little small property owner really wants to stay in the neighborhood, be part of the neighborhood, they might live in the neighborhood, and we're losing those, and we're losing those with some of the property tax changes that have happened. And a good example of that would be the one uh, antisocial. And an elderly Asian woman has owned it for over 40 years and had always wanted to keep antisocial there, the skateboard shop, um, which is a big driver in the neighborhood. However, the property tax got to a level that she knew she couldn't charge antisocial enough rent to cover hers and she didn't want to go into her mortgage. So she didn't want to pass on property to her kin that was going to be have a mortgage on it. And so she ended up selling to a developer. She wanted to keep it. She wanted to stay there. She wanted antisocial to stay there. And I think we need to recognize, and I think that's an amazing part of being the my BIA experience, is we actually represent the property owners and the properties um, and the small businesses. So you start to get a better understanding of how the dynamics works on building the corporate side of our small neighborhoods. So I want to get to a question that maybe John would maybe enjoy hearing the answer about. So I, I think that with these, just to comment off of um, Alyssa's point about moving into the single family areas. So we have these streets like Commercial Drive, Main Street that are, I would say, quite important. Now that the, the division between richer and poorer is getting bigger in cities than in Vancouver, the, the public realm has become more important. Public space and private space have become blurred, but public space is more, much more important, I would argue. And so you have these streets like Cam even Camby Village, Main Street, Commercial Drive. And so how do we, you know, how do we, because the tendency has been to dump density along the arterials. So how do we go in and, and, and talk to, to people uh, in single family zones or, or anywhere uh, that, you know, can we have some sort of compromises here? To me, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I, maybe I could give a couple of examples. We're, we're um, in the in the quadrant uh, bounded between our house is between uh, King Edward, Maine, Canby, and Sixteenth, and so we're sort of technically in a park uh, deficient area. And so green space is, you know, it's, it's important to um, to uh, maintain that amidst a densifying uh, community. So finding creative ways to introduce that 
green space and having that be part of the conversation is a really important amenity. And so just finding out what the concerns are with the local neighborhoods as that density is coming in. An example, another example just down the street from us is the, for, for those of you that are familiar with the Turner's Dairy site. How many people are familiar with the Turner's Dairy? So, uh, it's uh, 17th and Ontario. It's a, it's a heritage uh, heritage building. It has gone through a number of uses over the past number of decades, from, a, from originally from a dairy to a furniture uh, warehouse and a whole bunch of others. Uh, it's uh, a development application has just been reapproved there, and of course the concerns around um, around parking uh, and access and safety in the neighborhood come up. But we didn't really have the city come forward with a comprehensive plan to look at what we needed in terms of safety, uh, traffic, and so on. So people reacted to density in a really ne negative way. And I think if that had been part of the discussion uh, at the front end, it would have made um, the resistance of my neighbors, I was in support of the development, but the resistance of my immediate neighbors a lot less. Um, so what, one of the responses by the city was to, to address part, some of the, the biggest issue, which was parking, was to require a zero parking development to come back with 13 sites, uh, 13 stalls on site in a very constrained space. So what that did is it just increased the, the cost of each one of those units by $50,000, increasing the affordability problem when parking isn't actually a problem on our street. So it's just, you know, if, if, again, if, if the development of, if the insertion of this density is done on a piecemeal uh, basis without a broader conversation about the impacts and amenities, then it's going to be really hard to get density approved in the city and density that's on a synthetic scale like that. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, I, I think it's always interesting how, as Tamim said, they looked at the site, this is the development boom, but they didn't look at what the impacts, and I think we need to start looking at outside in before we even start talking about density in buildings and what kind of buildings. I mean, I live at 7th and in, in Scotia. The traffic in the last, I'm going to say six years along this side street is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And the city could have gone in when we, and we asked for it in the community plan, you know, control the traffic in the neighborhood. And now we have density around it, and we have cars zooming it up and down. Um, anyway, I, I just want to ask Tamim something. You're recording numbers per hectare yeah. of density. Do you know what the density is in Mount Pleasant? I, I can tell you just Please by looking. Please tell us. Right <laughs> looking, it depends on the block. So, um, you know, the broader area, like the, if I, I did it because I teach an uh, urban design class at, at, at SFU. And so I we play a game called, which, uh, yeah, which Michael said. Uh, many years ago, but you play a game called Spot the Density. And you'd be surprised if you look at um, areas like, um, if, if people are familiar with the towers around Edmonds, uh, those had a density of about 80 people per hectare. The area around uh, Broadway Commercial was as great as that, without any towers in sight. So it's quite deceptive what you see on the ground versus what you feel. Um, South Falls Creek is about the same as North Falls Creek the absence, if you take out all the green space, with the absence of the big towers within 10%. So I get, I guess that it's about 80 people, uh, 60 to 80 people per hectare in that city hall, uh, 16th to 12th kind of zone, and it presents as a single family neighborhood. The short answer I think would be, uh, for me would be yes, and I did just um, coming out of an uh, untethered from uh, civil service and being able to say this, um, uh, bureaucrats are afraid of big processes, unnecessarily, because they're afraid of the potential outcomes. And so the bigger the process, the scarier it becomes. Uh, but I think the more rewarding it is, and it makes your, e your work easier over the long term. And so I think that's the big brave step for the, for the city, is to, as much as possible, take drive from a vision to a, Builds a community consensus to the site, rather than starting at the site and trying to fight those battles uh, one off because it doesn't it doesn't move us through to where we want to get to. I I'm sorry. I just wanted to say um, there was a lot of community engagement in Mount Pleasant, and um, people do care if they are interested. They will step to step step up to the plate. I think the issue um, that happened with us, with, with the site at um, the dairy is, is the trust
between what the community feels they're putting forward and we, you know, we walked out of the community plan with this feeling like we've contributed. We, we, we've said, you know, we want to keep this, we want to keep that, and this is the way we want it to develop. And um, then things started happening, and it seemed like what we said got pushed aside. So I think when this process moves forward with the Broadway, I think we need specifics. We don't need generals. When we read the community plan, that plan is open to a lot of interpretation. A lot of interpretation. And, Michael just told me it's, it's a guideline. So um, I think that people, again, should not be afraid of participating. I think there are a lot of people that want to participate. Um, and there's amazing ideas from the community because we know our community and we know the special places and we, we have a feeling of the way it should go. I think one of the, to follow up on that, one of the things that also works really well is when people see projects come forward that match what the community is looking for. Um, right, we had some development come in, social district were brought into Mount Pleasant, just off the kind of area we're talking about, um, so 7th and Scotia, 8th and Scotia. They kept a heritage building, they brought it up to a certain standard. We brought in a brewery. Um, Lawrence Paul has an amazing art gallery that when I walk home after work, I'll stop in and chat with him. I'm talking to one of the most amazing artists in the world, sitting talking about his forest fire piece. And then I walk next door and have a beer and go home. I mean, that is an amazing opportunity to have to walk home from work, be able to go talk to an amazing artist, have a beer with someone I know, and go home. I mean, that is what Mount Pleasant has. So you need those wins. And I think that's what the Northway plan is missing right now, is there's good things happening, but they're not seeing the wins. And I think that's what, if we want to deliver plans, we need to make sure that community benefits are delivered early. Because people want to see that you're going to step up to your part of the deal. Sure, we had a council yesterday that was like I, uh, went ahead with LRT in Surrey, right? So I think that we're going to look in with Bombardier, who's as many employees they are. I do think in the federal election happening next year and the funding, it looks like from what I've seen that we're looking at the Broadway subway line going all the way to UBC. Um, that is kind of the discussion, and right? I mean, obviously it's not going to be over. That is the talk of what's happening right now. Um, and the funding. However, there is a good example, and Gil Kelly and our team at the city so far, when this first plan showed up, I was at the restaurant, and I think it was Danielle brought it to me and said, look what they did. They put a little circle around the transit hub, right around your heritage triangle, Main and Broadway. I went straight to City Hall to talk to Gil, I was not a city council at the time, and said, what are you doing? Because you're putting extra density on our only heritage triangle. I, and, and he's like, well, we've done some stuff to ensure no speculation. I'm like, half the stuff's already been built or sold. Half the buildings in this area have already been sold. And he said that we're going to look at different ways. So yes, it has. It, there's different ways of doing transit. This looks like it's going already to UBC. It might not go all the way there. What we need to do is look at what we could do to make sure we preserve our urban villages. The Mount Pleasant BIA has actually joined up with all the five BIAs and hired a lawyer to ensure what happened on Canby Drive will not be done in here. So small businesses are protecting themselves to ensure that the built form is not going to wreck their businesses and they don't have to leave for a few years and come back because that is absolutely detrimental to any small business. So currently, and I know you're shaking your head right now, <laughs> right? We're going to look at what happens when it comes forward to council, but at this moment it looks like the subway is coming through and we got to do everything we can to protect our urban villages and our community in doing transportation planning right. You're a counselor. Why, what do you mean it's coming through? It, it doesn't have to come through if, if council decides it won't. Yeah, right now, there's an opportunity with the federal and provincial government to get the funding to pay for it all the way through, and it'll come to council, and I'm not going to speak for council as a whole, but we'll make a decision at that time. But we we'll also need to ensure that the BIAs and the small businesses are ensuring they're done right, and the community and the community planning can involved because transportation will be a big part of the citywide plan and so it'd be great to hear the community get involved um, in that discussion. Um,